Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our discussion, or rather questions, about the impact of the invasion on democracy and economy, worldwide, as well as in our region. Kalosorizo to sympatriotes mas, ke tus pethimizo oti kathos είναι μια διεθνής διαδικτυακή συζήτηση. Πιστεύω ότι κατανοούν ότι έχουμε και ομιλητές που δεν είναι Έλληνες και έτσι θα διεξαχθεί στα Αγγλικά. Inner Post, an institute on development and governance, was founded by Γεράσιμος Αρσένης, a brilliant and humane economist and politician. Who, whom we lost exactly six years ago. Innerpost is assisted by an international advisory group, two prominent members of which are today with us, along with two compatriots. The invasion of Russia of President Putin to Ukraine has, I think, manifold and intricate repercussions on international law, on the virtual absence of the United Nations and its Secretary General, which I deeply lament, as I have spent half of my life in the UN, as was also our sense. The millions of refugees, the war crimes, the possible use of chemical weapons, the food and energy supply chains, the inflation, cost of living, the sanctions, and also the domestic repercussions of this invasion in Russia, in the United States, and in European countries. We can uh, remember what Prime Minister Draghi said that about the Europeans. Peace or air conditioning. Yet, beyond those, the big question is whether we are facing a major drast uh, dramatic act in an ongoing process of the end of globalization and the related apotheosis of free market and the short-term profit. And instead of uh, going towards a new economic policy with regulations and measures to deal with um, uh, inequality, we will face probably the resurgence of fragmentation and nationalism and possibly populism and authoritarianism. And in that slope, what may come to democracy and economy? There is the rub. But Professor Luca Caccelli, which is also the founder of Inner Post, along with her husband, Erasmus Arsenis, as the president now of the International Advisory Group, in her introductory remarks, will deal with these momentous questions. Luca, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Sotiris. Kalispera se olus. Talleme sa elinika, yeti thamilisum ogosipe o kiros musuris sangika. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Sotiris Mousouris, uh, who was the president of the of Inner Post of the Institute, and he was former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. As he said in his speech, he was in the United Nations for many, many years together with the Erasmus, and uh, is a person who has contributed lots to peace internationally. All of us both panelists and audience, I think, everywhere in the world are shocked by what has been happening with the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, 
uh, we can sit and talk and analyze the reasons for that invasion, but there is no doubt that there are thousands of victims. And I think we are all here to say stop a war, which is ongoing and has so many victims. The purpose of our seminar and of our webinar today is however, to look a little bit ahead and to try and discuss what are the likely repercussions of this cruel invasion. What have we learned from history? And what can we say will happen to all of Europe and actually the world all over? So uh, as we think about the future, there are a set of questions which I think we need to address. Let me pose them for our panelists so we can hear their views and then try at the end to summarize the major conclusions. The first question, as uh, Dr. Musuri said, is actually what are the likely implications of the invasion and its aftermath for the post-Ukraine world order? Can we speak of a regime change or a post-globalization world, as Dr. Pevelak has wrote in an article? What, is, what are the likely characteristics of that post-Ukraine global order? Is it a deglobalization process, fragmentation? Are we likely to see protectionist policies all over the world? A return to nationalism? And what are the likely implications for democratic politics? The second question, has to do with the political and economic repercussions in the two major blocs, in the United States on the one hand, and in Europe on the other. What are the likely political and economic implications, both for the economy and for democracy? And what is the likely the international role of the United States in the world? There has been a big shift from Trump to uh, Biden. And what are the likely repercussions for politics in Europe as a result of the French election yesterday, but also of the Germans' dependence on oil, and also its major decision to, to have expenditures and arms. Now, the fourth question has to do with the likely interplay between domestic politics and the stance of each bloc relative to the Ukraine invasion. Have domestic politics in the United States, in France or Germany, impacted on decision-making related to Ukraine, the way they have responded, the sanctions that have been imposed? And how are the Ukraine developments and what will we see happening impact on domestic politics in our countries? Finally, what are the likely repercussions for taxpayers and for all of us in other European countries, including Greece? What are the likely economic repercussions for inflation, the cost of living? We see here in Greece, inflation has surged and people cannot make ends meet uh, at the end of the, each month. There is a tremendous uh, lowering of their purchasing power. And is this likely to continue? Are we going to see also food crisis developing as supply chains are being disrupted? And that brings us to the major question about energy flows because one of the major sources of inflation are energy costs. And do we have the time Europe had embarked on a green transition? How fast can we move into the green transition? What are the likely repercussions for the flows, for energy flows into Europe? What can be done about it? And for us in Greece, this is especially important given Turkey's important role in terms of as an energy supply. Before I close and uh, we address all these questions to our distinguished panelists, 
let me say one more thing that for us, especially in Greece, it's especially important to see Turkey's role. Uh, let me say personally that I'm quite worried about seeing Turkey becoming a major negotiator in the process, especially noting that Turkey has been actually one of the aggressor in terms of Cyprus, and this has been in the past something which is still haunting us. So with this in mind, let me open the discussion and let our guests take the lead. And uh, I'm sure the questions are common to all of us. The answers might be different depending on each one's position of the analysis, but we'll have a chance after the initial presentation to have a discussion and have comments on each other's uh, words and presentation so that we can have a rich discussion that we can all learn from. Thank you so much for being with us and looking forward to your presentations. So Thank you, Luca. Thank you very much. As uh, I mentioned earlier, we have to sharpen our questions and you presented them beautifully. Yes, uh, Turkey is uh, taking some steps to, to have the two parties meet. Since Mr. Guterres is busy in New York and he cannot visit the capitals of the world that he should do it anyway. Mr. George Prevelakis, Professor Emeritus in Geopolitics, Université de Sorbonne, and now Ambassador and Representative of Greece to the OECD, has the floor. Mr. Prevelakis. Thank you very much, Mr. Mussouris, and uh, thank you also, uh, Professor Caccelli, for this, uh, for this uh, invitation, for this opportunity to discuss with our distinguished uh, uh, colleagues, uh, those, uh, those fundamental issues. Uh, now, you, you have uh, formulated a series uh, of questions that cover a very large spectrum, and uh, I, obviously each one of us will uh, try to uh, address one or two, and obviously from uh, his or her uh, point of view or approach. Uh, now, I start from a hypothesis. I tend to believe that we are at the moment of change of era. Uh, is it uh, similar to the end of the Cold War? Is it similar to the end of the Second World War? Difficult to say. But in a certain sense, sometimes I think that uh, we are in the equivalent of the moment when the uh, uh, Second World War was finishing and the Cold War has not, had not started again. Let's say in 1945. Uh, it was very difficult at that time to imagine the world that was coming, it was difficult uh, to see what for us became an evidence, the kind of alliances and divisions of the world that, uh, that, uh, that uh, would come. So it's very difficult to uh, predict, but I think that uh, we are in a similar, in a similar moment. And uh, the, the Ukraine crisis, is not the cause of this change, but it is a catalyst. I say it's not the cause because, because it is a horrible, uh, horrible war, but there have been terrible things in the past. And uh, uh, this seems to be different in the sense that it may, again, we are in a hypothetical mode, it may be a wake up call for, uh, for our societies, uh, for our democracies. Why I say a wake up call? Because I think that we have been asleep for a long period of time, unable to understand that uh, uh, a series of uh, crises were challenging uh, the way we were perceiving things during the post Cold War uh, period. Uh, 
our perception was to, to a large extent uh, influenced by Fukuyama's end of history. Uh, the idea that uh, the, the tragic nature of, of human history disappeared and that we could uh, uh, hope to live in a pacified world uh, dominated by, uh, by the rules of economy. Um, now, in that, uh, in that vision, I think we can uh, oppose the vision of geopolitics or the vision of geography. I'm a geographer and uh, I am a disciple of a very important uh, French geographer who was uh, Jean Gottman and who in the, uh, in the early 50s had uh, uh, introduced a very interesting theoretical framework uh, based on uh, the idea that uh, there is a, 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 an opposition of two categories. The one is the what he called the circulation or the movement factor. And the second is what he termed as iconography. Um, to go fast, I would say that uh, the main idea is whether the uh, geographical space is unified or not. Uh, and if not, how it is fragmented. So the uh, uh, our great illusion of the end of history led to the hypothesis that the world would be unified. And uh, we constructed this unified world through, uh, through globalization, which of course was not a complete globalization. It was a half globalization because it was economic globalization without going to the political globalization. Uh, now, this economic uh, globalization, which means the development of the movement of the circulation of goods, of capitals, of people, of ideas, uh, has, has brought enormous benefits to humanity. Uh, because the, the movement circulation is a factor of progress, undoubtedly. Uh, and uh, the, the benefits, we know them, uh, it is the, the growth of the wealth, it is that poverty went down, it is that in the developing world, uh, a middle class emerged. All those things are true, of course. But at the same time, our geographical approach uh, teaches us that uh, the movement is a factor of change. And when we say change, it means that uh, we can also have uh, destabilization, tensions, crisis. This is something we underestimated. And crisis did come, first of all, the economic crisis, the economic and financial crisis, which was to a, to a large extent the consequence of uh, the extreme connectivity of the world, an enormous financial system in which there were no borders, no checks, no balances, something that happened in one place uh, was uh, uh, very rapidly pre present in the whole world. Very easy to destabilize such a system. Uh, then uh, we have the problems related to uh, inequalities. It's not that globalization brought inequality in general, but it changed the landscape of inequalities. So uh, inequalities diminished between countries, but increased inside countries. And this of course created enormous political problems, divided our societies into two. And this is what we are uh, seeing now with uh, the growth of populist movements. The sanitary crisis is not without relationship with, uh, uh, with uh, this unification of the world. Since again, on the one hand, we have uh, pushed uh, the limits of nature. And then uh, of course, this uh, extreme connectivity means that, uh, uh, that uh, 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 sanitary problem in one point gets everywhere. 
And finally, last but not least, this, uh, this connectivity, this uh, movement, this circulation of ideas, instead of bringing humanity together, as we thought, that was the big illusion, that the more we communicate, the more we understand each other, on the contrary, has created uh, great uh, tensions and great problems of identity. Also, migration is a factor that has created those, those, those tensions. So we end, up, we end up with a series of problems that have not been addressed, have not been uh, fully understood, have not been related to those, uh, to those fundamental geopolitical, geographical uh, issues and structures. And we end up uh, now with uh, uh, the Ukraine crisis uh, that uh, challenges all this, I would say, economistic illusion by the, 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 the presence of uh, war, not somewhere far away from our uh, prosperous societies, but on our doorstep, and uh, which reminds us of uh, our tragic uh, European history. And so I think that uh, we are arriving to a point of a realization, and this realization will uh, lead to a reconfiguration of the geographical space, which means that, uh, first of all, this reconfiguration has been, has has, has started taking place already. I mean, we have seen phenomena of protectionism in the past, in the States, in, in Europe. Um, we have seen xenophobic behaviors. We have seen uh, uh, neo-nationalist attitudes. But now the, I think the problem takes a, a larger form and will lead to, to, to a larger debate. Uh, and uh, uh, we will have to see how we can manage this kind of a retreat to the globalization in order to avoid, uh, to avoid the most dangerous uh, effects of that. And one, of course, very dangerous effect is what everybody is seeing, the perspective of uh, the world being divided into two hostile blocks, uh, which uh, an evolution that may bear the, the worst danger, which is the danger of a, of, of, of a third world war. Uh, the, uh, I will end by saying that uh, uh, the term of deglobalization or the term of protectionism uh, are inadequate to express what is in front of us uh, because uh, this uh, change of the, uh, of the circulation field will not take a simple form. It will function on different scales. It, will, it may function on the scale of the world by dividing the world into two. Uh, it can function on the on the level of uh, of states. It can function on the level of mega regions. For example, it may, may lead into into a, a more cohesive Europe, but also a more closed Europe. And it it can end up to also to uh, to uh, fragmentation even on the level of uh, city neighborhoods. So it's going to be a very complex system, system a multi-scalar system, but uh, which will, uh, uh, will lead to new forms of, uh, uh, of control and of regulation of, of circulation. I think I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, you ended up with uh, seeing fragmentation in front of us and two worlds, or probably more than two worlds. 
Well, uh, you gave us a lot of interesting ideas and thank you very, very much. And I will ask Professor Richard Parker, who is lecturer in public policy and senior fellow of the Sorenstein Center, Harvard University. Thank you very much, Dr. Masuris, and thank you. Professor Parker. Thank you very much. And George, excellent presentation. Thank you. I, I'd like to build on it. Uh, but first, let me thank Luca Castelli for inviting me here. Uh, Luca has been a friend for more than 40 years. She was 11 years old when I first met her. Uh, and uh, I uh, also count as a dear friend whom I miss all the time, Jerry Arsenis, who was one of the great figures of modern Greek political and economic life. And so in a sense, I'm honored to be here because in a sense, it's honoring Jerry. Um, let me sort of try to talk about a few things by starting from an American point of view, because I'm an American, and uh, America has uh, been cast over Europe for most of my lifetime and is likely to still be cast over my son's lifetimes uh, in the years ahead. But as you all understand, America is itself also going through what I think is a major turning point in its history. Um, the Yale political theorist Stephen Skoranek has argued about uh, the American presidency that while America has had nearly four dozen presidents uh, since George Washington, and virtually every one of them sought to be a transformative figure, only about half a dozen have achieved that. And what Skoranek notices is that these transformers appear at intervals of three to five decades and ask the question, why? And what he says is that these presidents who are successful as transformers enter history at a moment where a prior paradigm and a prior set of political alliances uh, are weakening and fragmenting themselves. And it's the transformers role to create a new ideological narrative and to create a new political coalition that holds together after his presidency and lasts in various ways for, as I said, 30 to 50 years. Uh, Skoranek argues that in the 20th century, the two actual transformers in American presidential history are Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan. And we can talk about the characteristics of the long Roosevelt cycle and the long Reagan cycle, but the argument that he and I independently uh, uh, make now is that this long Reagan cycle is coming to an end. We talk about it obliquely as the fall of neoliberalism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what we have to understand is that the project of American political conservatism has fundamentally failed on a number of fronts. Uh, and that the desperation that you see in Republican political behavior is an awareness that that long cycle is coming to an end and they are in a search to try to constrain the emergence of a democratic and more progressive cycle that seems to be on the verge of emerging. Now, let me try to emphasize that Reagan came into office with a, an economic narrative that promised among other things to balance the budget, to lower the total share of government spending in the economy, uh, to ignite growth, and none of those was achieved. The two principal achievements domestically and internationally of the Reagan cycle uh, can essentially be called drastic increases in inequality uh, of wealth and income, uh, and also a radical financialization of what once was an American economy in which finance as a system played a relatively minor and ancillary role to the real goods economy and the production of goods by firms in the real goods economy. What we're doing right now and have been doing since the Great Recession and is a process that is ongoing and necessarily has to be, is trying to reconfigure both that fact of inequality and also the impact that financialization has had. The difficulties are that Unlike the Roosevelt period and unlike the early Reagan period, the ability to control both of those processes is complicated by the fact that America is much more integrated into a global economy than it was when I was a young person. As late as the 1960s, the sum of export and imports was less than 10% of GDP. 
It's now well over a third of GDP if one sums up exports and imports. And one can see particularly in the structural impact of what's called the deindustrialization the, uh, de of the heartland of America, the consequences of that uh, import-export expansion in terms of the structure of production and also the structure of a broad middle class that emerged as a consequence of long Roosevelt cycle policies. Now, what I wanna do is think about what the consequences are going to be of what I refer to simply as Putin's war. Um, I'm uh, cautionary about it because in speaking with this many Greeks on the, the call, I'm reminded of that great Greek Socrates who said, I am the wisest of all men for I alone know that I know nothing. And I want to emphasize the level of my ignorance about what is coming next. I want to situate that ignorance, however, within some estimation, speculation, I'm not sure where that falls, but that depends centrally first on the length of Putin's war. If for whatever reasons, Putin's war stops, it can stop as an armistice, it can stop as a collapse or defeat. If it stops in this calendar year, that presents one set of options. If it, if it ends next year, it presents, or in the next two years, it presents a different set of options. If, however, it drags on, as America's recent wars in Afghanistan and the Middle East have for two decades in the case of those two wars, then we have an entirely different set of problems on our hand. Let me try to talk about what that means. First, let's talk in military terms because fundamentally this is a military invasion by one sovereign country of another and is being pushed back both by the military and the armed citizenry of that second country with the assistance of many allied countries that are providing material and logistic and strategic support to that military and, and armed uh, citizenry. Um, what I can fairly assume out of this is that we have put new life blood into the NATO system a system that was born in the late 40s to address the challenge of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has been gone now for three decades, and now a new challenge has arisen from the same territorial ground uh, that it originated from when Russia was at the center of a Soviet Union. What the nature of that NATO will be, uh, who will spend on what, whether or not there will be new members admitted. <coughs> there has been talk I've heard on this side of the Atlantic that Sweden and Finland and perhaps even Georgia might be considering membership, whether NATO members will accept them or not is a different case. All apart now from the question of Ukraine's joining uh, NATO uh, presents a whole set of questions about what it means to rearm NATO in, ter in, in terms of what threat the Russians represent uh, beyond the borders of Ukraine. Then I think I wanna leave that as a question because I don't have an immediate answer to it, but I think it's one that we're going to have to address, which is what are the military alliance consequences of this war for Europe and America, and then more broadly uh, for the world, because China as always is lurking out there and is not a direct a threat to the NATO system as such, but clearly represents a challenge to the underlying political, cultural, and economic values that NATO thought of itself and thinks of itself as defending. The second thing that I think is clear in terms of vector, but not in shape or pace, is the move toward what we would call a post-carbon energy economy. I don't want to go all soft in California on you and sort of uh, wave, wave my, my, uh, my uh, hat in the air thinking that we're going all solar and all wind in the next five years. But it is clear now that we are incorporating a strategic and political strategic idea of the importance of moving quickly on energy that goes beyond the arguments of scientists concerned about global warming. 
Um, how that will play out again, I think is something that we can talk about in this discussion. I don't wanna use my 10 minutes here to go into the details of it, but I wanna highlight that as an area that we need to uh, discuss in great depth because to go beyond the current system means reallocation of sources of current forms of energy and then choices about other forms of energy that are not simply the, the celebrated ones of solar panels and, uh, and uh, wind machines. Third, let me talk about finance because what I grew up in was a, an America that was created by Franklin Roosevelt and the long Roosevelt era. And I teach a course on president's politics and economic growth and uh, show as one of my charts to my young students, the rate of bank failures from 1930 up to uh, 2020. Uh, and what you can see is the absence of any spikes whatsoever until one comes to the 1980s, where you see a series of spikes. And then of course, in the Great Recession, another great series of spikes representing the fundamental failure of a core institution of finance, which is the commercial banking system at the middle and small retail levels. Now, what's happened though, is that we have created a globalized financial system that nonetheless is a Euro-American system that has gone global. We need to emphasize that because it's going to change in the coming years in terms of the locus of power within that system, but still fundamentally London and New York represent anchors to what we think of as a globalized system. And I prefer the term Euro-American globalization or Euro-Americanization of the globe to the idea of globalization because I don't wanna get caught up in the rhetoric of deglobalization when I don't think that adequately describes what the problems are that this period has created. What I think we have seen already is that there is going to be much more emphasis on transparency in terms of uh, uh, financial transactions, which I broadly take as a plus. But the commitment rhetorically by politicians and by administrators in the, the public sector uh, to greater uh, transparency is not the same as achieving that transparency. Uh, the second is that we have a system of regulation that still rests primarily on national systems of public sector regulators and a thin system of international coordination based on treaties or agreements uh, that need uh, great reinforcement and great revisiting in terms of detail. I don't wanna go over the issue of offshoring of funds, but it's central to the success financially of the Putin uh, oligarch political system that uh, exists in uh, uh, Russia. But it's also key to the wealth of uh, uh, plutocrats in the Middle East and, and Venezuela and a number of other places. One has to think of the petroleum system as essentially a plutocratic system by its nature, which will have to be addressed politically for its plutocratic power if in fact we are going to move forward on this energy transformation. So I place the two, the energy transformation and the issue of finance in a juxtaposing set of relationships that we're going to have to talk about in much greater detail. Finally, I would uh, emphasize that we are going to have to talk about an idea of democracy that goes beyond where we are today. I think that we as intellectuals don't criticize ourselves enough for being part of a post-Second World War Cold War liberalism that elevated the issue of <clears throat> participation of those who have historically been marginalized in what in the 19th and early 20th century terms were fundamentally white male democracies, um, but that we haven't fully enlarged institutions of democratic experience beyond the opportunity to vote. Uh, we've increased the number of women elected to office. We have women running large corporations or universities. The same could be said in America of people of color, but there is a need for a fundamental rethink, not only because we morally owe it to ourselves to see democracy as an evolutionary system, 
but because I view the rise of populism as an expression of deep anger by those who don't participate in the upper middle classes or turn to the New York Review of Books or the Financial Times or The Economist for their information. As a revolt of those people who believe that people like us are at the heart of the problems that they're experiencing. We do not yet have a way of successfully reaching outside of our political neighborhood to create a politics that would transcend those kinds of class barriers. One of the features of the early Roosevelt period before the Second World War was that it was a, was a liberalism that was trying to do that. We, for a variety of reasons having to do with the ascendancy of the Cold War, have inherited a system that thought that the issue of the working class for us was simply an issue of opening up educational opportunities at the secondary level that would then create a massive, highly educated middle class that would go on forever in its celebration of the role of universities and professors professors and the world that we enjoy. So the final point I want to make is that I think that what Russian invasion of Ukraine opens up for us is the need for a deep and ongoing reflection of the role that intellectuals than what John Kenneth Galbraith many, many years ago called the new class associated not with the production of goods, but the production of symbols and ideas needs to be revisited. Let me stop there and uh, again, thank you all for letting me be part of this conversation with you. Microphone, please. So Didi, you need to unmute your... So so, Didi, you need to unmute your mic. There. I had opened it earlier, but something happened. Well, I want to thank Professor Parker, and I'll turn now to a European French lady who is professor, Lord Bagri Professor of Economics in London Business School, Hélène Ray. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mussoris. And I'm also extremely grateful to Professor Luca Cazzelli for inviting me on this uh, very uh, interesting panel. It's an honor to, to speak here. So I'm going to go back to some of the questions that Luca uh, asked actually at the, at the beginning. And I'm gonna make two points. One is gonna be on the European response uh, to the Ukrainian war. And the second one will be um, linked to the first one, but will be on the emergence of geopolitical and economic blocks. Um, so first of all, on the European response, I think the war is not going away. Uh, Putin has been using massive propaganda, brainwashing and repression with his people to back his imperialistic war. The power of fake news, the power of the distortion of history is extremely strong. Russians have been conditioned to believe, for example, that they alone have beaten Nazism during the Second World War. And now they are being told that Ukraine is Nazi. This is very similar, if you think about it, to what was described by Hannah Arendt in her book on totalitarianism or to Orwell's novel 1984. Europe keeps the Russian war machine going by buying Russian oil and gas, despite the atrocities, despite all that we know that is happening right now in Ukraine. This is despite the never again motto that we have had since the Second World War. So with a number of economists, uh, we wrote a short text actually calling our policymakers to act now and to stop any energy imports from Russia um, by Europeans. We believe this is actually the only way to stop Putin and to stop the war from spreading. Indeed, even with financial sanctions, the Russian government remains supplied with foreign currency by sales of fossil fuels. In particular, EU imports bring about 650 million every, euros every day to Russia, 650 million euros. So effectively, Europe is helping to fund the Russian war. 
implementing sanctions incrementally may alleviate the economic costs for Europe, but Ukraine risks disappearing in the meantime and the war may spread. We should decrease our energy consumption immediately following the International Energy Agency advice, but also we should do three things. So the first thing is to completely ban Russian oil imports. The second one is to put a tax on Russian gas imports with proceeds allocated to Ukrainians. And the third thing is to cushion the shock on low income households in our economies by doing uh, targeted fiscal transfers. So let me take that in turn. So banning Russian oil imports. Europe imports about 4 million barrels a day from Russia. It is possible to do without it because there are significant capacity margins outside of Russia. Without a supply and demand response, a fall in global oil supply equivalent to EU imports could raise the price per barrel by about to, to about $175. That's a Goldman Sachs estimate. But uh, if we take into account the drop in demand and the increase in supply outside of Russia, because there is some substitutability uh, for, uh, for oil uh, supply, the increase would be much more moderate. In some European countries, of course, the embargo could cause difficulties, but that could be managed by European solidarity. Second point, putting a tax on Russian gas imports with proceeds allocated to Ukrainians. So unlike oil, uh, whose market is global, and this is why there is some substitutability across the different sources of oil, the gas market is local and supply is hardly substitutable in the short term. A total embargo on Russian gas imports is unrealistic in the short term, given the level of dependence of some countries, but a temporary tax, a large one, on Russian gas imports would reduce demand and the rents paid to the Russian suppliers. The pipelines, they cannot be moved, so Russia cannot sell gas to others. The pipelines are fixed. So the price increase would not benefit the Russian suppliers, whose income would be reduced. And at the horizon of next winter, demand would be reduced and non-Russian supply increased. So the third uh, action that we should take is to cushion the shock on low-income households in our economies by doing targeted fiscal transfers. So the effects on the increase in oil, gas, and electricity prices are, of course, proportionately greater for low-income households because of their consumption baskets. But reducing full fuel taxes, as some politicians recommend, uh, in particular in my country, by the way, would have the opposite effect uh, to that intended since it would not reduce demand and it would keep Russian exporters' income intact. To maintain the price signal and the reduction in demand without increasing social inequalities, we do have to implement temporary fiscal transfers to low-income households. Now, we strongly believe, and uh, I speak, I think, for me and the, uh, the economists who have signed this uh, text, which is on voxeu.org, uh, 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 that strongly reducing the Russian fossil fuel imports is a political and a moral necessity at this point. Uh, it's uh, the only way to stop the war and, the, and to stop the war from, from spreading. It's also an economic and ecological necessity. And this, I will, um, I, I will agree with what has been said by the previous speakers, that uh, the imperative of decarbonizing the European economies requires drastically reducing dependence on fossil fuels and now is the time to do it. So in the very short run, we may actually go a little bit against it because in the very short run, we will use as substitutes for our electricity production, maybe a little bit more coal. Uh, certainly we will uh, uh, use more liquefied gas, but uh, all that will be uh, if well planned in order to do better substitution for the medium term and to go quicker into renewable energies. Now, at this point, uh, if you look around Europe, the main obstacle to the action I described seem to be uh, in Germany, uh, because the German government is very worried about the economic consequences uh, of, uh, of the uh, tax on, on gas, for example, and, uh, and also on banning oil exports. Uh, the French position uh, at, uh, right now, I believe, is in favor of stopping oil imports, 
But it obviously depends on the results of the French presidential elections on the 24th of April. And so far, the public opinion in France seems uh, surprisingly oblivious of the links of one of the two uh, final candidates for the second round, Marine Le Pen with uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, few people actually remember that the, uh, her party has a 9 million euro loan from a Russian bank and that she said she would be keen to have Russia as an ally after the peace, whatever that could mean, and that she would take some distance from NATO, would have economic policies incompatible with EU economic policies, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the French election is very important for uh, the set of policies I just described, uh, together with uh, what happens in Germany. And of course, if there could be a consensus also among other European countries. We do have, of course, uh, Hungary, which is also in the list of uh, strong opponents uh, to this type of, uh, of policies. So this is not easy. But the French election is also very important for the future of geopolitics. Uh, if Macron is elected, we will have most likely two blocks. On the one hand, uh, the US and uh, with the EU, uh, relatively closely uh, united. On the other hand, we have a China, possibly Russia bloc, and the strength of the relationship between Russia and China is a key determinant of what the world will look like. China's main economic partners are obviously the EU and the US because Russia's GDP is uh, very small compared to the, the trade links of China with, uh, with Russia are very small compared to the trade links between the EU, the US and China. But from a geopolitical point of view, of course, and because of the long-term strategy of China for natural resources, China has gotten closer to Russia. So the key questions are really, how much will China support Russia? How dependent will Russia be from China? And are we moving towards a North Korea style status for Russia? Probably not quite as outside Europe and North America, many countries do not seem to be keen to ostracize Russia. The Ukraine war is seen in the rest of the world as a European war. There are accusations of hypocrisy because of US invasion of Iraq, because of Syria, because of Yemen, etc. And a large part of the world who is dependent on Ukraine wheat, for example, is suffering indirectly Lebanon, Egypt, Morocco, all very dependent on Ukraine imports of wheat, uh, are seeing food crises. So Africa, in some sense, is at the forefront of a new power struggle. China has invested a lot there. Russia is more and more present in Western and Central Africa. Mali, in Mali, in Central African Republic, displacing France. So we are seeing more and more rivalry on the ground in, uh, in Africa. And this rivalry between the blocs, I think, will be increasingly reflected in other realms, technology and financial in particular. There is a clear push to establish a non-aligned payment system outside of the dollar, which is still in its infancy. But we see a lot of talks between India, United Arab Emirates, Russia, China, having discussions about bilateral payment system in currencies other than the dollar. We had the episode of the freezing of the Russian central bank reserves, uh, which uh, will have most likely a long lasting effect. So we see China building very gradually an infrastructure that will lead to an increased use of the RMB internationally. So in my view, we are seeing the emergence of a world which is much more divided in blocks which will see reshoring of supply chain within each region and increase competition between uh, the blocks. Smaller countries outside the blocks will have a harder time. And the roles of multilateral institutions such as the IMF will be much more difficult. How in such a world are we gonna get minimum cooperation to address global issues such as climate change? I do not know, but I think this is one of the most pressing issues that we should be working on right now. Let me stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ray. You 
have something in common with what you said with uh, Mr. Provialakis, the world divided in blocks from different origins you came to that of Crucium. The next speaker is Mr. Kostis Tambolis, Chairman and Executive Director of the Institute of Energy for Southeast Europe. Mr. Stambolis, you have the floor. Please push the unmute. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Musuris, and thank you, Luca, for inviting me in this very um, interesting and uh, high-powered uh, panel. Um, uh, I, I, I meet here new old friends like uh, George Prevelakis, and I think I will be making new ones with uh, Professor Parker and uh, Professor Ray. So I'm in very good company, and I'm grateful for this uh, uh, for including me in this uh, very interesting and highly stimulating panel. Um, lots of issues have been raised and uh, it would be impossible for me to address the various aspects that have already been discussed. But let me, um, I think, agree with most speakers that what we witness today is a major rift. We don't know where this is going to lead us, uh, but uh, from the signals we have been getting uh, all around us, not just during this crisis, but also during uh, the past, the, the second half, I would say, of um, 2021, uh, the, the precursor signs were very strong as far as the um, economy is concerned, and then the geopolitics are concerned. And this, of course, culminated in the invasion. An invasion which I think should have been um, averted if the uh, institutions we trust have been doing their work properly. So I think we witness a major failure of institutions, whether this is EU, whether this is NATO, whether this is uh, United Nations, I might say. What, what is the, where is the Secretary General of the United Nations secluded in New York? I mean, to me, it's unthinkable that we have a major war in the middle of Europe and the UN is nowhere to be seen. So just, just an example of institutional failure. Now, the rift is there. We don't know where it's going to lead, but we see the centrifugal forces already at play. Um, and I would like to put my uh, disposition at two levels, the global and the regional. And the global, uh, as Luca said in her introduction, she started without the implications on globalization. And then the original one, as far as Europe is concerned, where energy is obviously the most visible exponent of this crisis. Obviously, we have uh, a supply chain interruption, but this started almost 12, 16 months ago with, with the pandemic. And it continued, and it still continues. We see this happening in China today with several cities in China uh, locked up. So the supply chain interruption is still with us. I mean, we have not read any of this. Um, so this led to um, major um, shortcomings in the global energy supply system and hence prices lifted up. They increased in, uh, started increasing in the, um, from the second quarter of 2021. And of course, carried on as we were heading towards the end of 2021 and well into the first Q of 2002. So, um, we start with the um, 
crisis with, on, with COVID. It, it, it transforms into an energy crisis globally with high prices and culminates into a geopolitical crisis with the invasion of Russia in the, the Ukraine. So the global implications are not just as a result of the invasion in, of Russia into Ukraine, um, but also a carry on from the COVID crisis, which is very global. So we see global and regional um, mishaps coming, coming together and obviously creating uh, something which is very uncomfortable uh, when, we, where, when we see how markets behave at local level with high prices and inflation. Now, let's come to the regional aspects and the implications on the energy situation. Now, the energy situation in Europe um, is far more difficult and more unstable compared to the global one because uh, the uh, way that European markets have developed over the last few years as a result of the um, European single market. So we have the European single market and as a follow-up, we have the European electricity and gas markets, that is the European markets. And these markets have uh, developed on the basis of energy exchanges, including electricity and gas. So we have departed from bilateral uh, uh, agreements concerning prices, and we have moved into an open system where market forces are determining the prices. So far, so good. But here we have a crisis, and I'm not referring to this one, I'm referring to the one that started in 2021 with uh, the global oil market becoming very tight, followed by the gas market, and focusing on Europe, we have huge explosion of prices. Uh, and we have an inability from uh, at market level to see markets, uh, to see prices uh, leveling down. Obviously, these markets are um, money markets, in essence, the electricity and gas markets, and therefore the powers, the market forces are very strong and are determining to a great extent prices. At the same time, we have a shortage of energy within the EU because of the green agenda. We have several coal-fired plants which have been retired over the last few years with the result that the energy suppliers, when it comes to bid for electricity, they don't have any more the um, alternative to opt for uh, coal fired, they go to gas and gas is very expensive. So we see that the very uh, um, well-intentioned uh, goals of the EU to uh, raise the green agenda is also having negative effects on market operation. We have the Ukraine crisis, and this is making matters far worse because although we do not have any gas disruptions, let me remind you that throughout the whole crisis, gas flows from Russia to Europe have not been interrupted. So we do, not, we do not face as yet a gas interruption situation, which will push prices even further higher up. But we have a lot of uncertainty. And also before that, 
since mid-2021, uh, we had a situation where we had a lot of gas storage depleted or almost depleted, very low, which Russia, which controls the gas storages in, in many countries, many two or three countries in, uh, in Europe, knew that in advance. So um, we, we have definitely fallen into a Russian trap when it comes to the management of gas in the European Union. I, I, I'm not going to deal with what we should do short term. Uh, I think uh, Professor Ray uh, uh, really discussed this at, at some length, although I disagree to a large extent with what she said. I think the fundamental question is how we're going to cope with our energy predicament in Europe. And Europe has very ambitious plans to minimize um, uh, the um, emissions by 2030, net, net zero 50 and all that. But the energy mix is not following that. In 2000, in 2000 the energy mix in Europe was 80% fossil fuels. In 2019, and 1.5 trillion investments in renewables, or about 1.2, and this has dropped to just 70%. So the energy mix, global and regional, are not that um, versatile. I mean, you, you cannot change the energy mix that easily. Therefore, I think, to cut a long story short, uh, Europe will have to rethink its energy policy, uh, will have to include more uh, nuclear if we're going to stick to lower emissions. We have to produce more gas locally, that is indigenous gas, and we have three or four areas where to do that in the North Sea, in the Adriatic, in the Black Sea, in the Aegean, in the in, in East Mediterranean. Uh, we have to do a lot more energy efficiency, that is drop our level of consumption without losing comfort. And we have to rein on markets. That is, uh, Europe, European planners will have to go back to the uh, drawing board and see how the uh, their energy markets work to institute certain caps, because you cannot really uh, leave everything to the market, especially when it is energy. It's not just a stock market, it's more than that. It, it is energy, which means it goes to people's houses and businesses and so forth. Therefore, uh, a rethink and redrawing of the mechanisms which control electricity and gas prices, I think is a priority. And another priority is how to minimize your um, emissions by uh, uh, making your energy mix uh, more um, uh, manageable uh, without, without um, uh, handicapping your um, uh, situation as far as emissions is concerned. It's a, it's a difficult equation. But it's not impossible. Uh, we have designed we have designed far more complex uh, things. Therefore, uh, I think I'd like to conclude by saying that the the current crisis uh, is an opportunity for us to rethink uh, the way that we use energy, um, that uh, we transport energy, and uh, also with uh, what the Professor um, uh, what Professor Parker said about the energy transformation. Yes, I, I, I think we, we are in the energy transformation uh, situation right now, uh, the energy transition, and is not something that can be um, 
seen as a, a very linear um, approach. It, it is multifaceted. <clears throat> we have several options. We have, I think, to rethink several of these options and to have a broader discussion at the global level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stamboli. Uh, well, and thank you for raising the issue of the silence of the UN Secretary General. He is not silent in New York, he speaks, but he doesn't travel, he doesn't, has not met anybody, he has not tried to, to find some uh, face saving formula for ceasefire so and so forth. And that uh, is very dangerous because it reminds us what happened to the League of Nations. And uh, colleagues of mine, in, tomorrow we we'll have a meeting exactly on this matter, how to wake up our Secretary General. But uh, I want to ask you something before uh, uh, Luca takes the floor. Uh, there is a myth, uh, the Greeks like myths and they're very suspicious people. They say that US is very happy because now can export gas to Europe, makes oh. money. <laughs> and uh, yes, we hear yes. also that. It's, 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 a, it's, that? Yeah, it's a very valid point. Um, <clears throat> now, now we're going to talk nitty gritty, right? Uh, <clears throat> the, um, uh, on March 8th, on March 8th, the European um, Commission unveiled uh, the plan called Repower Europe. That is a first reaction on how to deal with the current crisis, trying to substitute uh, Russian gas with other types of gas. Now, we import something like 160 to 170 billion cubic meters of Russian gas, corresponding to about 40% of our uh, gas needs in Europe. And this gas obviously will have to be substituted. Now, I do not agree with uh, uh, Professor Ray, who said that we'll have to immediately cut this gas, tax it and all that. Yes, obviously we have to do certain things and we have to minimize and even stop our reliance on, on Russian gas. But I don't think it can be done from one day to the rest without a major repercussion on the markets and on the prices. But I'd like to address uh, Dr. Moussouris' um, observation. Now, what the EU is saying is out of this 150, 160 BCM, by the end of this year, 2022, we are going to change to, um, uh, to change over uh, 100 to, to substitute 100 BCM. And how can this be done? It can be done by uh, imp importing a little more gas from Algeria, a little more gas from Norway, a little more gas from Azerbaijan, with which um, Europe has uh, pipelines. Uh, but these countries cannot produce a lot more extra. And also the capacity of the pipelines is not that big to, in to, to, to increase it to the tune that we'd li we would like. Um, what else are we going to do? We're going to produce some hydrogen and some biomethane, biomethane very little, and hydrogen a little more. And some of these will come from other countries, fine. And the bulk of this, 60 BCM, we're going to bring from LNG. Now, this is liquefied natural gas. And already Europe is out of the 400 BCMs gas that we use every year, 100 is from LNG. But to, re to, to really change 60 BCM in a year, less than a year, it, 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 it is a, it's a, ve a very demanding uh, thing, which cannot be satisfied by the current, um, the, the current capability of the global market. So the global market cannot really supply this. I mean, the global market is about 500 BCM, but cannot supply because there are fixed contracts and there are long-term contracts between countries and exporters and importers, which cannot be that broken. Hence, United States very kindly has stepped in and says, yes, we're going to supply some of this gas. And they didn't say that we're going to supply all of this gas because they don't have it, but we're going to supply 15 BCM. And the rest, 
we will have to look where from to get this. But again, we have some problems in the sense that Europe has not got the necessary infrastructure to substitute all this gas with LNG. So we shall need a minor Marshall plan over the next two years and something like 50 to 60 billion euros investment to build more infrastructure to enable us to bring more LNG to uh, substitute Russian gas. So it's a question of time and money. Thank you very much. And probably we should have some dialogue among you. So Luca will uh, take the floor now and uh, ask the first question to anybody you want. Luca. Thank you very much. And thank you all for this uh, very interesting uh, uh, discussion and the different views that have been expressed. Allow me to share a few thoughts as to what I heard in terms of what we agree, we can agree on. I think we can all agree that we have lived through successive crises over the past decades, from the financial crisis to the pandemic crisis, to a migration, actually asylum crisis, which we should not forget, to a climatic crisis, and finally to a geopolitical crisis. Now, there, is, there are some important characteristics of this crisis. They are all global. And as it has been already said, it's the byproduct of a globalization which has been rather anarchic with no regulations and no global governance. I remember in the 90s when I was in the States and the earlier, global governance reform was at the top of the policy agenda because people could see that globalization was coming. Now the, we've, we have post Bretton Woods institutions, including the UN, which are becoming increasingly, in my view, irrelevant. Why are they becoming more and more irrelevant? Because corporate interests have taken the lead. And there is a Swiss study actually, which I find incredibly interesting. You have 140 major corporations which control about 80% of world transactions. So we are talking about the corporatism, which we've seen through, success, through these successive crises, managing to some extent the crisis and being the ba major beneficiaries of this crisis. So in the financial crisis, you've had major banks, which have been dominant in policy setting. In the pandemic crisis, you've had major pharma companies being the major dominant actors in setting policies. In the climatic crisis, you have energy companies being the major stakeholders. In the geopolitical crisis, again, you see now energy companies and armament companies becoming very important. So in my view, we should not forget in terms of the two, two aspects of, of what we live through. First, the importance of corporate interests and actually the, the more the weakness of national governments and I would say even the EU itself or regional or supranational governments or uh, regulatory areas to set the policy agenda. So one of the interesting questions I think is who actually drives policy making? And is it what has been said and we all agree about the failure of institutions, is it a byproduct of that globalization as we've seen it develop? Is it a coincidence that you don't have the UN Secretary General taking the lead? It's not a coincidence. In my view, it's not a coincidence. It's a byproduct of what actually both uh, George Prevelakis and Richard Parker said about the, the thin system that we have of global regulation or of a global leadership to some extent. There is no, in my view, there is no strategic vision, and that has been characteristic 
of Europe as well. There is no strategic vision and there has not been a strategic vision for many decades as to what Europe we would like to do and how to deal with Russia. And I'll come back to that because I think this is one of the problems. The second thing that we all agree is that there is a major rift. And I think we all the speakers have said that we're not talking about a unified or uh, space, but there is a reconfiguration of geographical space as George Prever like to said, and uh, uh, a world in transition as Richard said and uh, Ellen focusing on the major rift between East on the one hand and West on the other. With the blocks developing with Africa being in the middle, having to, to see where it fits. And I would say also the Middle East and us here in the Eastern Mediterranean having a tremendous dilemma as our interests are very much intertwined both between East and West. So we're talking about a major rift. And my question, which I cannot answer is, do we want this rift to happen? And if we don't want this rift to happen, how should we think of policy making, both politics and economics in the years to come, in the decades to come? If we feel that actually this rift will be a source of uncertainty, Shouldn't we think and rethink of our policies, both in terms of the energy or the financial transformation or politics in terms of to avoid it or lessen it? Do we want it to aggravate or do we want it to, to have to mitigate this rift? And that's a question that I think all policymakers all over the world, both in the US and Europe, need to think about. The third thing is who benefits? from the geopolitical crisis and the Ukraine invasion or Putin's war, as we've said. Well, apart from some very specific corporate interests, that is my source of disagreement with the lens uh, proposition about banning oil imports and tax on Russian gas imports. Um, the, my disagreement is more political, Elen. What, what I'm worried about, I'm very much worried about democracy, democracy in Europe. The fact that you have Orban being reelected, that you have Le Pen and Mélenchon coming so high up, means that there is a division deep in our societies, which actually is very dangerous for democracy and for democratic institutions. So the reason why I would not go for ban on oil imports and tax on Russian imports is are the reasons that Kosti Sambolis raised, that this will produce, first, you do not have in most of our societies the fiscal, the capacity to do fiscal transfers. And if you see prices increasing even more, you'll have a revolution, which will be a delegitimization of our political process even more than what we have now. There is a big crisis of human security in our societies. And if human security, if people cannot make ends meet, if there, is, if there are inequalities, deep inequalities in our societies which are aggravating, if right now you have a you know, uh, hike in prices and even further prices, you will see a shift to the extreme right or, ex or the shift to the extreme left, which would, go, which would undermine the possibilities of our societies to stick together. So in my view, one of the things that I'm worried about is that, and it seems to me that we all mention it, but we, it would be nice in the, you know, to, to refer to this when you come back, all of you, is that we need to think of the energy transformation, of the financial and monetary transformation, but we really need to think deeply as to how to keep social cohesion together and uh, how to avoid the deep inequalities that are coming. Because don't forget that on top of the geopolitical, the Ukraine crisis, we have technological, major technological developments that also create rifts within our societies. So if you combine 
the repercussions of the Ukraine invasion, together with the technological shocks and the climatic changes that are taking place, and the energy poverty, et cetera, et cetera, this could have dramatic implications for democracy, in, in, at least in Europe, that I know better, over the next years, and inequalities deepening. And that brings me to the last point, which is what Richard mentioned, the length and the length of the war and the invasion as a key parameter. And I would like to hear your views as to what you think about George Prevelakis and Richard and Elaine and Yugoslis. What do you see as the most likely scenario? Are we looking at Ukraine as a Europe's Vietnam War? Kind of having this problem for more than five years? Isn't to our interest to see a, a kind of a coming to you know peace settlement as early as possible, and who will take the lead? Can Macron take the lead in in resolving, or can Biden take the lead? I'm not so sure, but we need we need some leadership in this process and some and the law is missing from Europe. These are some of the thoughts that I wanted to share with you. And maybe we should have uh, Sotiris I come go back to you to have a kind of our speakers share some views and comments on each other and on what has been said so far. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you very much, Luca. Very good summary of the discussion and go to the gist of the problems. And I wonder who is going to ask a question or uh, make a supplement of what he said. Please raise your hand. I see Professor Prevelakis. Preve First, Mr. Prevelakis. Yes, Luca has asked a direct question, and I think it is a very important question about the timing of, uh, of the crisis, of the Ukraine crisis. Uh, in uh, in uh, the, the Greek newspaper, Kachimerini, of Sunday, there was uh, uh, an interview of uh, James Stavridis. James Stavridis is a Greek-American admiral who was uh, the, the chief of NATO at a certain moment. Uh, and, uh, well, his guess is that uh, we are going to end with uh, uh, an unsatisfactory response for everybody. What he sees is uh, that we will arrive to a kind of a compromise, maybe before the big parade uh, in Moscow, which is due, I think, in, in May. Uh, in which uh, Putin will not obtain all that he wanted, but he will obtain some territories. Uh, the Ukrainians will uh, uh, exchange peace for the abandonment, for the loss of territory. And the other thing that we have to take into consideration is that for us, the West, the sacrifice will be to abandon sanctions. So nobody will be happy. Uh, and uh, that's how compromises are. Now, who, who controls the time? I'm afraid it is Putin who controls the time. Uh, he will decide uh, at what moment he wants to declare, uh, to, to, to present as a victory what has been, to a large extent, a, a failure. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we, we will not be able to refuse because he has the Ukrainian population, he keeps them uh, in, in, as hostages. I mean, this, this, this terrible massacre, he's using exactly the, you know, the, the means of, of terrorists or of criminals 
uh, he's, he's destroying a whole population. And this is uh, for us uh, a terrible dilemma. Uh, I mean, how, how can you refuse a very, a very uh, ugly compromise if the other option is to, uh, to be responsible for the continuation of this? So I think that the, for, the first, uh, the first uh, moment will be this kind of humiliating uh, compromise, but uh, I hope that uh, this humiliation will lead uh, to a wake up and therefore to, uh, to, uh, to a, new, a new strategy, a new policy uh, in order to uh, avoid that uh, this situation repeats itself because we know that in Putin's dreams, uh, uh, the Ukraine is not the end and that uh, the reconstitution of the space of the Soviet Union uh, seems to him as something uh, completely legitimate. Uh, now, this of course leads also to the question of uh, our energy dependency. I also don't think that uh, we can, uh, uh, free ourselves from energy dependency because of the political consequences, because this may bring about uh, political consequences in our countries that may uh, undermine even further uh, democracy. But we will have to do it in the medium and long term. And hopefully we will have the wisdom and the determination to do it. There, uh, the positions of the various countries are different. And I think that the weak link is Germany. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Mr. Parker, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, um, on the question of the length of the war, I uh, necessarily am drawn back to the mistakes of the Iraq War, the Afghanistan War, the Vietnam War, the, the uh, Balkan War, and uh, the first Gulf War, um, all of which entailed in one form or another, with the exception of the first Gulf War, the idea that goals could be expanded and achieved in ways that would uh, uh, pass quickly. Uh, none of the great wars of the 20th century were started uh, or enjo were joined by parties thinking that they would be long wars. Uh, my assumption is that the Ukrainian army could very well be defeated in a narrow sense on the Donbass uh, in this coming surge that the Russians are launching, but that the willingness of civilian militias of one kind or another to keep fighting would make Russian occupation of any kind so costly that Putin couldn't treat it as a victory and therefore would lead to a kind of savage repression of the population population reminiscent of what the Nazis did in Poland, Ukraine, and Russia in the uh, Second World War. So I, I'm very concerned uh, about uh, the fact that this could be a very long war that isn't constrained by a formal armistice signed by governments if a significant number of Ukrainians don't believe that um, they have gotten something out of this that guarantees sovereignty and dignity for them. Um, so we shall have to see what comes from that. Um, I think on the issue of uh, energy independence from Russia, I think that the, the, continued, uh, goal, the continuing goal as fast as possible uh, is, uh, is the goal. But uh, like Luca, I'm very concerned about the fragile state of electoral systems in the United States and in Europe and the ways that the Republicans are beating up the Democrats about inflation right now um, and uh, massive surges in energy prices um, that would come from trying to cut off Russian supplies immediately uh, concern me unless I could see the math more carefully and Helen and her group may have done the math and spotted the surpluses available to throw in, but I'm, uh, I'm not aware of them yet. And that's my ignorance, not my disagreement. Thanks. Thank you. Madame Ray, you want to say something? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, so there are several things I wanted to comment on. So the first one is um, 
in a way, we have been talking as if globalization was the cause of the war and that, uh, you know, we have been blaming a lot the EU, the UN, etc. And let's not forget to blame who has actually caused the war, who is Vladimir Putin. Okay, and so I think we tend to, <laughs> to forget a little bit the basics. Um, and I wish I were as, as optimistic as um, uh, indeed as um, uh, uh, Professor Prevalakis about the possibility of a deal between May 9th. Uh, I think there is a very serious risk that uh, not only this war drags on, but that this war spreads. And uh, of course, uh, as we are speaking, very incredibly incredible atrocities are happening next to us. And uh, not acting, uh, here I'm just gonna, you know, cite Mario Draghi, you know, you can choose between having the air conditioning on or having peace. Okay, and I think by discussing the price of energy, we are losing a little bit sight of the first order. Of course, of course there's gonna be a cost if we implement an embargo on oil and if we put a tax on gas. Of course, there's gonna be a cost. Uh, there are some uh, macroeconomic analysis which can give you some estimates of uh, the GDP losses for various countries, which are, they are heterogeneous. They may not be non-negligible. It depends a lot on uh, a number of things, on the capacity indeed of having more uh, LNG being put, et cetera. We are getting out of winter on the other hand, so this gives us some months uh, to increase our, our capacities. And for sure, we need uh, an energy mix. We need to speed up the green energy transition and we need an energy mix. And we need them um, also to be uh, decreasing our consumption of energy all at the same time to increase efficiency, et cetera. This is compatible with our long-term goals. We need to increase it. Uh, and we need to uh, not do what the uh, German uh, have been doing, which is to retire some nuclear plants. Okay, let me remind you that one of the biggest uh, German nuclear plants has been stopped and that the phasing out of nuclear energy in uh, Germany is still planned as far as I know. So there are some basic mistakes like that, having a Nord Stream 2, uh, phasing out nuclear energy that we should not make. But we have to be extremely proactive and we are the wealthiest part, uh, one of the wealthiest part of the world. So thinking that we cannot uh, be more voluntary in compensating uh, the low income households, um, you know, uh, it, it's a matter of priority again. We can do it if we want to do it. And all I know is that if we want to be sure or almost sure or a little bit more sure to stop the war and to stop uh, Mr. Putin right now killing people and doing atrocious things, we need to stop giving him 650 million euros per day to balance, not only to balance his budget, to have a surplus in his budget, to pay his weapons and his soldiers, and also to have a current account surplus so that he can keep his economy going. So unless we do that, I don't think anybody can say it's gonna end well. And for me, that's the first order. That's all. Thank if you. you like, if I can say. Mr. Prevalaki. Uh, what I said is not optimistic. It's not something that I like. As I said, it is, it is a humiliation. Then uh, you said that uh, we are the wealthiest part of the world. We are also the most spoiled world, the part of the world. Yes, are we ready for some sacrifices after what we had through? And uh, we haven't mentioned China in this context at all. In India and others. And um, my question is what will happen to the free market after all that? The corporate power. Is there going to be any change? Anybody? Mr. Parker? Well, I mean, I think that there are going to be changes. You're going to see more extensive transnational regulation of the financial sector. You're going to see greater insistence on transparency uh, uh, involving offshoring of financial and non-financial corporations. You may get greater uh, ability to seek out information uh, of various kinds. Right now in the United States, the number of employees who are 
uh, female or people of color is actually considered a trade secret by corporations and is not public information. I think that might be something we could change on a simple level. There's there's pressure for what I would uh, I would call a progressive era legal structure reform that's going on right now that is going to have a number of pro-consumer impacts and, and pro-public impacts. Uh, whether it's going to constrain corporations in terms of their aggregated power, that's a much more complicated question because that means tackling the campaign finance laws. And now what has developed into a world in the United States of so-called dark political action committees that don't have to report their sources of funding. Thank you very much. And Mr. Stabolis, uh, let's, we have to close soon. Mr. Stabolis. Yes, I'll be very short, some concluding remarks from my part. Uh, it's very, I think it's very difficult to postulate where um, and how this um, crisis will end, because from what I understand, and from the little I know the Russians I have come across, the, um, and the way that the system is organized, uh, the governance, uh, they're not going to accept defeat. And um, it would be wrong for them to appear to uh, enter into a kind of uh, peace treaty. The last thing they want is a peace treaty. So I think the war is going to, to drag on. It will uh, be transformed. Uh, but um, once they control the part of the Ukraine they want, uh, maybe they will um, uh, retreat to a certain extent, but they're not going to go into a peace treaty. Uh, anyway, the, 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 the lesson for Europe at this stage is, from, from the energy point of view, is this crisis is obviously a wake up call. And I think we have to look at it that way. And we have to realize that Europe is very dependent on energy imports, whether these are oil, we import 90% of the oil in Europe, and 80% of the gas. So this is huge dependence. And we can see now that we want to try and um, win ourselves from Russian energy, the problems and the obstacles that we face. So we see here very clearly the geographic, the geography talking to us, as George will say, the, the geographic constraints. And at the same time, we see the limits of globalization. This not clearer picture than Europe today, the energy scene in Europe is a very clear indication of these two constraints. So we have to look deeply and go into a new strategic vision as far as energy is concerned, and not only energy, but how markets operate. So these are very interlinked. And um, yes, we can try and minimize our dependence on Russia, and we should do it, starting with oil, which is, uh, we have more choices when it comes to oil, and step up our efforts on, on gas. But we cannot do it from one day to the other without the um, repercussions the negative repercussions we're going to have on the economy and to the um, social issues, which uh, Luca very clearly referred to, and I agree with that. So Thank you very much, because uh, yes, you brought us back to the title of our meeting, Democracy and Economy. I was not forget that. If there is nothing, nobody else wants to add anything. I wish to thank you very much for your contributions. I think we had a very interesting discussion, exciting discussion. The subject is vast and we don't know how to touch it. And we always face dilemmas, another Greek word. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you all very thank much. You. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. George, Kosti, and Richard.